Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, again, good to see everybody, and uh, boy, there was a table full of food back there today, wasn't it? Takes a while to get through it. Anyhow, good to see you all back in here, and uh, hopefully we'll get out of here before the snow flies, and I'm up here in a short sleeve shirt. It is winter time, but anyway, we're just glad you're here, and for those of you joining us on television, again, we just appreciate so much your letters of encouragement, your prayers for us, and... Uh, we just can't thank you enough. For all of you here in the studio, of course, we thank you for coming in and being a part of it. I couldn't do it without you. All right, I think that's enough for announcements. Oh, book 54, yeah. <laughs> My little wife is like a bulldog. She don't give up. <laughs> book 54, this will be the last program of the first two-hour segment. Okay, back to James. We're going to finish it, hopefully, and that'll be just perfect. We can start our next series in 1 Peter. All right, so back to James chapter 5, and remember again, I just got to keep repeating, for sake of those who missed a program or new ones coming in, that we're dealing with Jewish believers of really the, the gospel of the kingdom. They had believed that Jesus was the Christ, that's all. There's no reference to his death, burial, and resurrection for salvation. In fact, someone was just telling me that they had been in a Bible study. No, their Bible, wasn't it, Luther? Your Bible said there is how many mentions of Jesus Christ? Only two. Only two mentions of Christ, see? And so uh, don't, uh, don't accuse me of going off the deep end when I say that this is all part and parcel of the Jewish believers who had had their roots in those followers of Christ in his earthly ministry. And that's all they knew, that he was the Christ. All right, now there were, like I said in the last program, <clears throat> they were out there in the Roman Empire, and some of these have been out there since 606 B.C., of course, and so they had gathered wealth, and so there was this element of the rich in these churches. <clears throat> and so now, let's just start at verse 1 of chapter 5. He says, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl, for your misery shall come upon you. Now he's talking about the tribulation. And we're going to see that here in just a little bit. All right, he says, your riches, all the wealth that you've accumulated is corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Now, you may wonder what's meant by that. Well, I read in uh, a book of something or other a while back that in the ancient East, that was one way that they collected wealth was beautiful, fancy clothes, and they'd put it in trunks. That was just like we'd put money in the bank. And it was a collecting of wealth. But unless they were careful, just like now, moth could get in and destroy them, see? <clears throat> so he says, your riches are corrupted and your garments that they have been saving for a wealth in later days are moth-eaten. Verse 3, your gold and your silver, see, the accumulated wealth is cankered. In other words, it was materialism and it had nothing to do with their spiritual life. And the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and you shall eat your flesh as it were fire. In other words, their judgment is coming. Now, I see he's not talking just to believers. He's talking to Jews who are really on both sides of the coin. All right, verse 3, reading on. You have heaped treasure together for what? The last days. Here we go again. The last days. Verse 4, Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you, kept back by what? Fraud. Enron, then already. See? It's nothing new. Oh, bigger scale, greater technology, but the mentality hadn't changed. Hadn't changed a bit. All right? So you have taken it by fraud. And the cries of them who have reaped, in other words, are the victims of your fraud. All you retirees that suddenly have had everything wiped away, hey, it's nothing new. Nothing new. The cries of them who have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Now that's another term for Christ that comes out of the Old Testament. Verse 5, you have lived in pleasure on the earth. You've been wanting. In other words, they just, as we would say, 
They've lived high on the hog, nothing but the best. You have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Now, that could both ways. God has not stopped them, nor, you could take the other way, the just people that they've been misusing have not fought back. But whatever, this element of wealthy synagogue attending Jews, no doubt, that, G that uh, James could write to, and yet their lifestyle was anything but righteous people. All right, now verse 7. <clears throat> Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto... Now he's talking to the believing element, those that are the downtrodden, those who haven't got all this wealth. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the what? Coming of the Lord. See, it's just over the horizon. Now, you remember when I taught the book of Acts? Why were they so willing to cash in all of their savings and sell their houses and their lands? Because the kingdom was just over the horizon. Who needs houses and lands when you're going to have heaven on earth? And so they glibly, remember even good old Barnabas back there had land on the island of Cyprus. What did he do? Sold it. Brought the proceeds to Peter and James and John and the rest and put it in the common kitty. Because after all, all these things are right out in front of them. They had no idea that it would be interrupted. <clears throat> All right, so be patient, therefore, to the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it. In other words, the farmer who plants his seed and waits for the harvest. And he had long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. In other words, the early rain to sprout the grain and then the latter rain to bring it to fruition. Now verse 8. This is what I told you an hour ago I'd be coming to. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord. What? Draweth nigh. It's at hand. See? All right, now I'm going to show you a few others, and then we'll come back and see where we have the wherewithal to stop God's time clock. All right, turn on over with me to 1 Peter chapter 1, because <clears throat> I want you to see, as we showed several weeks ago, how all three of these writers, Peter, James, and John, and Jude, are all expecting the tribulation and the second coming to be coming in short order. All right, next page, 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 7, O Peter writes that the trial of your faith, see, he too is writing to Jewish believers, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. What's he talking about? The coming tribulation, see? Might be found, future, that it might be found under praise and honor and glory at the appearance hearing of Jesus Christ. Now, that's not the rapture, that's the second coming. They're looking for the tribulation and the second coming. All right, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, in verse 9. All right, now turn the page to chapter 4 in 1 Peter. 1 Peter, chapter 4, verse 7. Now, we looked at all these several programs back, but this is just review again to show how that all of these little letters were preparing the Jewish believer for the coming horrors of the tribulation that we closed our last program with. And then some reminder, I shouldn't have left everybody hanging on a string. Believers won't be there, remember. So we're not going to be confronted with all that death and destruction. We're going to be gone. Okay, now then, verse 7 of chapter 4. But, Peter writes... The end of all things is what? At hand. It's not 2,000 years ahead so far as Peter is concerned. The end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. All right, now then let's just move on to 2 Peter, chapter 3. And of course, Peter writes, as all this is just going to be coming right down the pipe. Now we have to teach this, realizing that we're in a 2,000 year later scenario, but like I said a couple programs ago, 
even though everything has changed, it's still pretty much the same. All right, 2 Peter 3, verse 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before the prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles, the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the what? The last days. Scoffers walking after their own lusts. And so Peter, too, is telling them, hey, this is nothing new. They've always said that nothing has changed. Well, here we are 2,000 years later, and we can still say that it's nothing different. All right, move on into John quickly. And uh, 1 John chapter 2, <coughs> 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Now, you know, like I said in my introduction to all this, I'm sure that all of these Jewish writings were accomplished before Paul even finished his letters. I think all of these were out there. I know tradition says John wrote at 90-some A.D., but I just can't reconcile it. Don't have to take my word for it, but this is the way I have to approach it, that this was all written probably before 60 A.D., and now look what Paul, uh, John says. Verse 18, little children, it is the last time. As you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. My, we could read that today, couldn't we? But he was writing in 50-some A.D., and they were waiting for the tribulation to begin at any time and usher in the second coming. All right, now I said, I'm going to give us the wherewithal to interrupt that timeline and come back with me quickly to Luke chapter 4. And this is the only indication in Scripture, and of course they didn't catch it, they didn't understand it, but Jesus himself gives us the wherewithal to open up our timeline and stop it before the tribulation came. And here we've come 2,000 years, and now we feel it's again right out in front of us. Luke chapter 4, you'll all recognize it. <coughs> Jumping in at verse 16. Luke 4, verse 16. Jesus in his earthly ministry came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Remember, I'm always stressing that he lived under the law. And he stood up to read, and there was delivered unto him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the scroll, he found the place. In other words, he knew what he wanted. He found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, in other words, to those that were waiting down in Hades, and recovering of sight to the blind, part and parcel of his miracles, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the scroll, and he gave it to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all them who were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he knew that. And so he comes back and answers their consternation. And I'll show you in a minute why they were so concerned. And he began to say, verse 21, unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. All right, now he's quoting from Isaiah 61. Most of you already know this. And come back with me to Isaiah 61, and we'll see how the Lord knew that the tribulation was not coming. He knew it was not the last time, but he never betrayed that. And, of course, being God, he knew exactly what the timetable would be. Now, I always have to explain to people, when Jesus said, no one but the Father knoweth the day or the hour. Well, he was speaking from his human side. And you always have to look at the things that Jesus said and did in his two personalities. On the one hand, he was 
total man. He got hungry. He got tired. He got angry. He was totally human. On the other side, he was totally God. He could raise the dead. He could steal the wind because he was God. Now, whenever he prayed to the Father, your will be done, not mine. He's praying from his humanity, just like you and I would. But on the other hand, he could forgive the sins of the woman taken in adultery because he was God. Only God can forgive sin. Now, it's the same way with that question about when would the Lord come. From his humanity, he could honestly say, I can't tell you. Only the Father knoweth. But you come over to the other side, what did he tell Philip in John 14? Philip, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known? When you have seen me, you have seen who? The Father. Isaiah 9 says just as plain as day, that unto us a child is born, a son is given, and his name shall be called what? The mighty Consular, the everlasting God, the mighty what? Father. So from his deity, he could have told the exact day and year and minute of every event. But from his humanity, he could honestly say, that's only in the hands of the Father. See, it's so simple. All right, so here we are now in his earthly ministry. He has read from Isaiah 61, and he's come through the whole first verse, word for word, but now you go up to verse 2 when he says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, he stops in the middle of the verse. And that's why the Jews raised their eyebrows and just literally stared him down. What's he doing? And so then he stood up the second time and said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. All right, now look what he's saying. Everything that had been accomplished in his earthly ministry is in verse 1. Now as you come into verse 2, he had finished up until his crucifixion now, preaching the acceptable year of the Lord. What do you mean by that? Israel had every opportunity to accept him as their Messiah, but they were going to reject it. Now look at the verse carefully. Where does he stop? just before it says the day of vengeance. See? He knew that the tribulation wasn't coming, and so he could stop reading and say, this has been fulfilled, and the rest were going to be left for a future day. All right, and then read on. After the day of vengeance of our God, which is the coming years of wrath and vexation, then the rest of the verse says, to comfort all that mourn. What's that? The kingdom. And that's still future. Now recap. Now recap. Everything that was written in verse 1 was accomplished. And he had brought them up to the place where they were ready to reject him. And so that had all been fulfilled. But the tribulation hasn't come in. The kingdom hasn't come in. He doesn't say that it won't but it's going to be postponed for at least 2,000 years. All right, now let's get back to James, and hopefully you got the idea that even though the Lord himself knew it, he didn't reveal it, but he did let us know that there was coming a gap in the timeline and that the tribulation and the kingdom were going to be postponed. But nobody understood that. Even the Apostle Paul, as I showed in the earlier program, always spoke of even the rapture of the church in his lifetime. In his lifetime. And you want to remember, he was probably about the same age as Christ. So by the time that Paul is writing that we are going to be changed and we will ever be with the Lord, he was probably uh, in his 40s, maybe 50. And you know, people didn't live to be 100 in those days. 60 was an old man in those days. So even Paul was expecting all of this to be culminated, certainly before 70 A.D. And that's why, of course, a lot of people today say that when Jesus spoke of all those things concerning the end time, he was speaking of 70. No, that was all just another preview 
of what's coming later. All right, let's get back to James chapter 5. <clears throat> we can finish the, the book. So he says, verse 7 again, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter day. In other words, like a farmer is waiting for his crop to ripen, they were to be waiting for the ushering in of the tribulation. All right, verse 9. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Verse 10. Take, my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction. So what's he getting them ready for? The tribulation. And he's telling those Jewish believers, this isn't the first time. Go back into your Old Testament and see how they suffered. Hebrews gives you a pretty good uh, description of them. Some were sawn asunder. Some were burned. Some suffered from the sword. There's nothing new in Israel's life. And so Peter's reminding him, hey, this may be in your future. I think I'm being appropriate to say the same thing for us. We have no guarantee that we're going to live this life of liberty forever. There may come a day, and it could come fast, that all of a sudden we're going to find ourselves under abject persecution. We hope not. And if the Lord comes, then those that are remaining are certainly going to go through this kind of trials and suffering. All right, so he's preparing them for these coming years of tribulation. All right, verse 11. <clears throat> Behold, we count them happy who endure. You have heard of the patience of Job. Now here he's going back to an Old Testament book that every Jew was acquainted with. And they knew the losses and the trials and the suffering of Job. And so Peter is using, or uh, James is using that as an example, see? is you've heard of the patience of Job, and you've seen the end of the Lord, how that God blessed him in the latter end more than the first, and that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. God hasn't changed. Just as surely as he dealt in Job's life with mercy and restored everything, he also is going to be with us, James says. All right, verse 12. But above all things, Things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, nor by the earth, nor by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay, lest you fall in condemnation. Now there again, that had more appropriateness for Israel under their system of law than it would for us, but it's still a good lesson. Be careful what you take an oath on. I think a lot of people carelessly, even with, with their giving, they may just say, Lord, I'm going to give you so many thousand dollars a year. And I say, you be careful, because God's going to hold it to it, and you may end up be going to the bank to borrow. So be careful about what you even agree with God. All right? And then verse 13, is any among you afflicted? Well, there's never been a point in human history where there aren't sick people. And they always have been and always will. So he says, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Absolutely. Is any merry? Happy? Everything going good? Then sing psalms of joy and rejoicing. Now let's go back and compare Paul. Come back to Ephesians. Back to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter... Five, I think I want. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 5. Let's start at verse 18. Ephesians 5, 18. Well, we got to hurry. Only a couple minutes left. All right, verse 18. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns 
and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's the life of the believer, see? And that's exactly what James is even referring to himself, that for the believer we are to be singing songs and, and psalms, which were hymns of rejoicing in ancient Israel. All right, now I've got to get back to James quickly or I'm going to run out of time anyway. Thought for a while I wasn't going to be able to fill the time with it, but it's coming. James chapter 5. Now he says, verse 14, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the assembly and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, I'll have to give another writer credit. This certainly wasn't original with me. Now, I'm not going to have time. When Paul was winding up his ministry, he could no longer perform miracles, but he writes that his friend, I don't remember the name, was on the island of Miletus, what? Sick. He was on the island of Miletus sick, and he couldn't do anything much more than pray for it. But to Timothy, he said, for your stomach's sake, take a little what? Wine. Now, here James advises the use of oil, but the good Samaritan used what? What did the Good Samaritan administer to the guy that was wounded on the roadside? Well, he dressed his wounds with wine and oil, which were the typical medicinal things in the ancient time. So it's kind of interesting that we get both of them, one from Paul, take a little wine for your stomach's sake, and James says, anoint with a little oil for healing. But for us, I think Philippians 4 just says it all. Worry about nothing, but with everything, with thanksgiving, make your requests known unto God. And then when we've done that, the peace that passeth all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And that means exactly what it says. Well, we still got a couple seconds left, but as you come on up then and uh, finish the little book of James, how that prayer has tremendous efficacy with God. And he uses Elijah. What did he do? He prayed that it not rain. It didn't rain for three years. And then he prayed again, and the rains started. So prayer still avails much. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry if this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldman.